Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and we're going to talk about pineal region masses. I have no financial disclosures. I've always wanted to be a shameless tool of industry, but nobody's willing to pay me. So when I first started learning about pineal region masses, they were called pinealomas. I soon learned that there is no such thing as a pinealoma, and that's why this lecture is called pineal region masses. In fact, pinealoma is a wastebasket term. The trash can in my office is labeled pinealoma. So pineal region masses are most commonly germ cell neoplasms that arise from embryologic rests of primordial germ cells. Our learning objectives. The most common pineal abnormality is a pineal cyst. The most common pineal neoplasm is some type of germ cell tumor. The germinoma histology is most common. It's a homogeneous lesion that engulfs pineal calcification. The second most common is a teratoma, which are typically heterogeneous with lipid. Pineocytoma and pineoblastoma are pineal parenchymal tumors, and they may have restricted diffusion. Pineal region masses cause paranoid or tectal syndrome, interfering with vertical gaze. Tumors of the pineal region may compress the cerebral aqueduct and they may cause hydrocephalus. And the tumors may therefore grow through the tentorial hiatus into the posterior fossa. Other lesions occur in the pineal region, including vein of Galen malformations, which are characterized by a flow void, meningiomas, which are attached to the dura, gliomas, and lipomas, which are composed almost entirely of fat. Here are examples of six different pineal region masses. I hope that by the end of this discussion, you'll be able to tell me which is which and give an intelligent differential diagnosis. So the pineal region, 60% of the tumors are germ cell tumors. And of these, two thirds or 40% of all pineal region masses are going to have the germinoma histology. Less than one seventh of pineal region masses arise from the pineal parenchyma. And there are several subtypes, pineocytoma, which are benign and well differentiated, pineal parenchymal tumors of intermediate differentiation and papillary pineal tumors, and pineoblastoma, which is a type of primitive nectrodermal tumor. And these are WHO grade four tumors. And as we mentioned before, other lesions also occur in the pineal region. Let's think about the pineal gland. Descartes said it was the seat of the soul. We know that it is responsible for our daily or diurnal biorhythms where we were active during the daytime. It also is related to our life cycle rhythms, including the timing of the onset of puberty and migration. We know that the pineal gland responds to light and dark, regulating melatonin levels, which are increased at night, because of an accessory optic pathway, the retinohypothalamic tract, which reaches the pineal gland through the reticular activating system and sympathetic nerves. So the pineal gland is basically like a third eye. Phylogenetically, in some animals, there is a lens over the pineal gland. Developmentally, and embryologically, because pineoblasts are very similar to retinoblasts. In fact, the mutation that causes retinoblastoma on chromosome 13 can also cause the patients to have a third focus in the pineal gland. So melatonin is the primary hormonal product from the pineal gland. What does melatonin do? Well, melatonin regulates the biological clock in all animals. In fact, melatonin is highly conserved throughout all animal and many plant species. The mammalian biological clock consists of diurnal rhythms in most animals. Darkness stimulates the release of melatonin. Pineal melatonin suppresses gonadotropin releasing hormone. A longer daylight cycle decreases the overall amount of melatonin. Decreased melatonin leads to increased gonadotropin releasing hormone. Increase in GnRH stimulates an increase in luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And so a longer daylight in the spring increases sexual drive and activity causing many mammals to go into estrus.
So when Alfred Lord Tennyson said in the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns the thoughts of love, it may be a primary biological effect of the prolonged daylight cycle in suppressing melatonin. Of course, I thought it was all due to the pollen. Let's talk about the pineal region anatomy. The pineal gland is sitting in the fluid filled space of the quadrigeminal plate cistern. It is behind the midbrain and anterior to the splenium of the corpus callosum. The lateral margins of the cistern include the thalamus, it's near the third ventricle and the aqueduct of Sylvius, and in the subarachnoid space in that location is the deep venous system. So the pineal gland is basically in the center of your brain, just like this red dot shown on this rotating image here. Because it is deeply located and because there are large veins nearby, a lot of time has been spent on determining non-invasively what the likely diagnosis is for a pineal region mass. And many times a parent of a child with a pineal region mass would prefer to avoid surgery. And in the case of the most common histology, the seminoma, external radiation and chemotherapy are the treatment that may be applied even in absence of a histologic diagnosis or a partial resection. We look here in a child and we know that this is a young patient because the sphenooccipital synchondrosis is not fused and that normally fuses at puberty. We can see the anatomic landmarks of the pineal gland, the clivus. We can see the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius and the fourth ventricle. We can see the corpus callosum. We can see the flow voids in the branches of the anterior cerebral artery. We can see the important venous landmarks of the internal cerebral veins, the great vein of Galen, which drains into the straight sinus. And the orientation of the opening in the tentorium, the hiatus, goes from the anterior clinoid process to the anterior margin of the straight sinus. So the pineal gland once again is barely above the tentorium and masses in this location and or obstructive hydrocephalus will displace the pineal gland and the tumor through the tentorial hiatus into the posterior fossa. If we look on the axial T1 weighted image, we can see very clearly here the postchiasmatic optic radiation, the mammillary bodies in the third ventricle. We can see the midbrain in the center, and the cisternal space that is behind the midbrain is named after the four lumpy bits on the back of the midbrain, the corpora quadrigemina. It's the quadrigeminal plate cistern. And this cistern is shaped like a smile. So we want to remember to look for the smile of the quadrigeminal plate cistern. And it's not something that's cryptic like the Cheshire cat. We should see this in every patient, and it should be symmetric. If we look at this brain section here, we can see why the pineal gland has its name. It's shaped like and has about the same color as a tiny pine cone. It's a roughly cone-shaped structure that is attached to the posterior roof of the third ventricle and lies in the quadrigeminal cistern just above the superior colliculi. The pineal gland oftentimes contains normal calcification, and the calcification of the pineal gland begins around the same time as the onset of puberty. The normal pineal gland, like this miniature pine cone here, is typically no more than 14 millimeters in maximum sagittal diameter. So it really is a tiny cone. Pineal calcifications physiologically begin around the time of the onset of puberty, and about 40% of people will have a pineal gland calcification. Something else that we need to remember about the pineal gland is that because it produces a hormone, it has no blood-brain barrier just like the pituitary gland does not have a blood-brain barrier. So the normal pineal gland will enhance on MR and CT. The intensity of the enhancement is directly related to the molecular weight of the gadolinium that we use on MR. An enhancement on CT may be masked if the pineal gland is calcified on the non-contrast scan. What about pineal region mass signs and symptoms? The most common one that we talk about is paranoid syndrome, not paranoid, but paranoids. 
Patients may also have precocious puberty due to loss of inhibition of gonadotropin releasing hormone because of the absence of melatonin. And the patients can have nonspecific, non localizing signs like headache, nausea, and vomiting. What is Paranoid Syndrome? It's a failure of conjugate vertical gaze. It usually begins with a problem looking up, but ends up being a problem looking up and down. Patients may also have dilated fixed pupils or medriasis. They can have failed ocular convergence and they can have eyelid spasm. Let's now begin our discussion of pineal region neoplasms. The differential diagnosis of a pineal region mass begins with germ cell neoplasms. We can have pineal parenchymal tumors. We can have gliomas arising from the adjacent thalamus and splenium of the corpus callosum. And we can have non-neuroglial masses like meningiomas from the dura, dermoid inclusion cysts, which are very uncommon, and vein of Galen malformations. This is a breakdown in more detail of the differential diagnosis for pineal region masses. Again, 60% or more are going to be germ cell tumors. Less than 15% are going to be pineal parenchymal tumors. This is a chart of the AFIP's survey of pineal region germ cell tumors. The most common histology was a germinoma, and the second most common histology is a teratoma. Fortunately for us, these two masses look very different on both CT and MR, and it's relatively easy to tell them apart. Intracranial germ cell tumors are usually primary and not metastatic. They are thought to arise from germ cell rests of the germ cell precursor cells, and these tumors are most common in the pineal or quadrigeminal plate cistern or in the supracellar cistern. Only exceptional cases of testicular or granatal germ cell tumors are metastatic to the CNS. The testicular veins and lymphatic drainage go to the renal hilus. The periaortic nodes drain into the lung. The lung may then cause systemic hematogenous dissemination, including the CNS, but only rare cases of testicular seminoma have CNS mets. One example of this is Lance Armstrong, who had a mixed testicular tumor, choriocarcinoma and embryonal CA, and he had CNS metastatic disease, as we all know, treated successfully. So if intracranial germ cell tumors are not metastatic, then how do they arise? Well, it's postulated that multipotential primordial germ cells migrate. They are misplaced during their migration and they reach the midline of the developing brain, most commonly again in the supracellar cistern or quadrigeminal cistern. Some kind of secondary factors influence the production of a neoplasm. And again, we have germinomas and teratomas as the most common type. So is there any evidence to support this? Well, by the third week of gestation, the primordial omnipotent multipotential germ cells migrate out of the embryo and into the yolk sac. During the fourth and fifth weeks of gestation, these primordial germ cells migrate back into the embryo along the dorsal mesentery, and then the gonads form normally during the sixth week. If something goes wrong with this migration, these multipotential germ cell precursors may develop into a neoplasm in an unusual or a different location. And that is the hypothesis for the formation of sacral, mediastinal, and pineal region, so-called extragonadal germ cell tumors. As the primordial germ cell tumors migrate back into the embryo, they're supposed to find the urogenital or gonadal ridge and then build a gonad. And when they go awry, they probably don't receive the same chemical messengers that would normally tell the cells not to produce a Let's now consider our basic approach to pineal region masses. If the pineal region is abnormal, the primary suspects to consider are the germinoma, the teratoma, a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, or a neoplasm of the pineal gland itself, a pineal parenchymal tumor. The germinoma and the teratoma are easily distinguished from the other two possibilities. Pineal region germinoma and teratoma both enjoy a very good prognosis. Germinomas have a 90% five-year survival, and pineal region teratomas have about a 74% survival at five years. So let's talk first about germinoma. 
Again, the synonyms for this tumor include seminoma, dysgerminoma, and atypical teratoma. It primarily presents in the first two or three decades with a distinct male predilection, oftentimes as high as seven to one. On imaging, it classically engulfs or surrounds a central calcification thought to represent pre-existing pineal calcification. In comparison to pineal parenchymal tumors, germinomas have increased ADC values, and the tumor may extend to involve the thalamus, the brainstem, or have CSF dissemination. Intracranial germinomas are WHO grade two tumors. They're thought to arise from primordial germ cell rests, and they show a, a classic two-cell histology pattern that we'll see in just a minute. They're relatively uncommon uh, tumors of the central nervous system in the United States and Europe, but they represent almost 15% of childhood CNS tumors in Japan and other parts of Asia. You want to remember that one of the presenting signs and symptoms is precocious puberty, which means the patients have to be prepubertal, so the patients tend to be relatively young. Some people say that the supracellular germ cell tumors have a female predilection versus the strong male predilection seen for pineal region germinomas. And again, this tumor is usually in the midline, most commonly in the quadrigeminal plate cistern. Intracranial germinomas respond to the same chemotherapy and radiation treatment that is used for testicular seminoma. And again, they enjoy a very, very good prognosis with a median survival of approximately 19 years. Let's talk about the imaging of intracranial germinomas. These are sharply circumscribed midline masses. They typically surround or engulf a central calcification within the pineal gland. They typically have homogeneous hyperattenuation on a non-contrast CT. They usually show homogeneous enhancement on both MR and CT, but they have a non-specific signal intensity very similar to gray matter on MR imaging. If you identify an intracranial seminoma germinoma, it's important to give contrast material and to look for CSF dissemination along the spinal cord. The classic appearance is shown here, a hyperattenuating midline mass related to the posterior third ventricle. One of the ways to distinguish a germ cell tumor from a pineal parenchymal tumor is to look at the ADC values. Germinomas have higher ADC values as compared to pineal parenchymal tumors, and the patients tend to be younger. In addition to looking at ADC values, it's also important to see if there are calcification. Localized calcification are seen in more than 70% of germ cell tumors, whereas peripheral calcifications may be seen in pineal parenchymal tumors. The exploded pattern of calcification was seen in this series in 9 of 11 pineal parenchymal tumors, and the engulfed pattern was seen in 7 of 9 patients with germinomas, and none of the examples showed the reverse pattern. Let's look at some additional examples of pineal region germinomas. We can see here, again, a homogeneous hyperattenuating lesion related to the posterior third ventricle and quadrigeminal plate cistern surrounding a central chunk of calcification. This is the pattern strongly suggestive of the germinoma histology. We can see here again a calcification in a central location. If we look at the coronal image here on the MR, we want to ask the question, where is this lesion? Well, the lesion is very obviously seen as an enhancing mass in the area of the quadrigeminal plate cistern, but I want you to notice that the lesion is primarily below the tentorium. Two-thirds of this lesion is below the tentorium. This is the most common growth vector for pineal region germ cell tumors. Perhaps the hydrocephalus is pushing the tumor through the tentorial hiatus into the posterior fossa. So we want to remember that even though the normal pineal is a supertentorial structure, pineal region masses predominantly grow into the posterior fossa. Here's another example in a different patient. Again, we have a tumor that is partially above and below the green line, which is the orientation of the tentorial hiatus. So the tumor extends below the tentorium. What is the histology of the pineal region germinoma? 
It's classically described as a two-cell pattern. One of the cells is a small round blue cell that looks like a lymphocyte and probably actually is a reactive lymphocyte. These small round blue cells probably account for the hyperattenuation that is seen in the non-contrast CT, but the cells in between probably uh, have sufficient water content to be able to prevent there from being restricted diffusion. Again, classic intracranial pineal region germinoma. Homogeneous lesion related to the posterior third ventricle, hyperattenuating, having homogeneous enhancement, and engulfing or surrounding a central calcification. Another example here, hyperattenuating on a non-contrast CT scan related to the posterior third ventricle and quadrigeminal plate cistern. And in this particular case, there is a chunk of calcification, but it's primarily eccentric. Remember, it is dispersed or exploded calcifications that we associate with pineal parenchymal tumors. When we look at the MR, we want to be careful to identify any involvement or extension of the tumor to involve the thalamus. We want to remember that the tumor can have a relatively nonspecific gray matter signal, but it's almost always going to show gadolinium contrast enhancement. This example involves the posterior portion of the midbrain. And again, another example here, where is this tumor? This one is almost entirely below the tentorium in the posterior fossa. Another example here, again, the tumor on the gross specimen is primarily below the tentorium. This patient also illustrates the common modes of spread of pineal region germ cell tumors. They can extend into the third ventricle and also extend into the supracellar cistern. Let's now consider the second most common pineal region germ cell tumor, the teratoma. Teratomas represent up to one third of all intracranial germ cell tumors. Just as a reminder, epidermoid and dermoids are inclusion cysts of the central nervous system. However, the teratoma is actually a true neoplasm. It is complex differentiation typically producing tissues from two or more of the three embryonic germ cell layers. Although most commonly they contain ectoderm, and they have been given the erroneous nickname of benign dermoids, when in actual fact they are neoplasms. The teratoma is typically sharply demarcated. They're oftentimes lobulated and multicystic. They have heterogeneous attenuation and signal intensity because they contain heterogeneous tissues, and the solid parts of a lesion typically show contrast enhancement. So what is the role model for a teratoma? What can we use as an analogy to help us remember the heterogeneity in a teratoma? Well, the role model for a teratoma is a hot dog. And when I was an intern, I biopsied one of the hot dogs from the hospital cafeteria. And the report came back from the pathology as scattered areas of striated skeletal muscle, fat, cartilage, bone, and smooth muscle, respiratory epithelium, and small intestine consistent with a teratoma. So you want to remember that a teratoma has all kinds of tissues all mixed up together, and they're going to produce all different kinds of attenuation and all different kinds of signal intensity on MR scans. Here's a classic pineal region teratoma, a multi-cystic lobulated mass with areas containing different types of attenuation. If we look here on the coronal T1 weighted MR, we can see some peripheral hyperintensity, which is basically sebaceous lipid material produced by the ectodermal elements of the teratoma. We can also see here again in the sagittal images that we have this lipid material on the outside. It's important to remember that lipid is not only adipose tissue, it can also be greasy, cheesy, sebaceous material. And again, two thirds of this tumor is below the tentorial hiatus. This is a fantastic example side by side of a CT scan demonstrating a focal area of remarkably low attenuation that corresponds to a focal area of high signal intensity on the T1 weighted MR.
And when we give contrast enhancement, we can see that the solid portions of the tumor show contrast enhancement. Very typical, virtually diagnostic and pathognomonic for a pineal region teratoma. This is a different patient here illustrating that a pineal region teratoma can be an encapsulated and circumscribed mass lesion. If we look at a biopsy of the wall, we can see some of the characteristic ectodermal elements. We can see the pilosebaceous units and the sweat glands. But if we look at another section from the same tumor, we can see the basophilic posse cellular material, which is cartilage. Pineal region teratomas may have spontaneous or post-traumatic rupture. The sebaceous lipid material may leak into the subarachnoid space or the adjacent ventricle and form a fat fluid level with an associated chemical shift artifact. This is the same thing that happens when you try to make salad dressing. You have the oil floating on top of the liquid, which is going to be water and vinegar mixed together. So a teratoma is a neoplasm and a dermoid is an inclusion cyst. And the teratoma arises from multipotential ectopic germ cell rest and the dermoid arises from surface ectoderm that's been dragged into the developing embryo. They're very, very different histologically and biologically for the patient. This is the case that was presented as a ruptured intracranial dermoid cyst but it's obviously an intracranial teratoma. There's a tooth-like calcification, heterogeneous lesion that consists of very, very lucent lipid material floating as a supernatant in the lateral ventricles, and a heterogeneous mixture of soft tissue and lipid attenuation inside the primary mass in the pineal region. If we look at the sagittal image, we want to remember that the patient was lying supine as the scan was done. And again, we can see that the supernatant with the T1 shortening is the lipid material with the flat fluid level at the interface with the CSF remaining within the lateral ventricle. So again, we have a centrally located third ventricle and quadrigeminal plate cistern multi-loculated heterogeneous mass most likely representing a teratoma and not a dermoid and we can also see here again a hairball floating at the interface between the supernatant lipid material and the CSF. The third most common pineal region germ cell tumor is the non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. Boy, I wish I had made up that nickname. These are situations where the lesion doesn't look like a germinoma and doesn't look like a teratoma, and you don't think it's a pineal parenchymal tumor, so it's gotta be a different kind of germ cell tumor. Basically, you can't make the prospective diagnosis of the non-seminomatous germ cell tumor. So if we look at a typical example here, it's an 18-year-old who presents with a gradual onset of bitemporal headaches and blurry vision, probably caused by diplopia from Paranoid syndrome. What we see on this CT scan is a supracellar heterogeneous lesion. But if we look on a higher level, we see that there is the appearance more typical for a germinoma, homogeneously hyperattenuating surrounding a central chunk of calcification. Histologically, this was proven to be a pineal mixed germ cell tumor containing elements of seminoma with some additional germ cell subtypes. If we look at the sagittal MR, we can see that there is a component of the tumor in both the supracellar cistern and in the area of the pineal gland in the quadrigeminal plate cistern. And again, both components show contrast enhancement. So this is a mixed germ cell tumor, not a teratoma, not a germinoma, but something that has a mixture of different kinds of germ cell tissue. As mentioned earlier, it's important whenever a lesion touches the ventricular lining or the pee on the surface of the brain or is an extra axial lesion that we look for CSF dissemination. This pineal region germinoma shows enhancement along the leaflets of the tentorium from CSF dissemination.
Here is another example of CSF dissemination, the classic and typical appearance of a hyperattenuating mass surrounding a central chunk of calcification in the midline region of the pineal gland. And then if we look at the sagittal MR, we can see multiple tumorlets that have dropped down into the subarachnoid space. In actual fact, for this patient, the spine imaging was done first for back pain, and it was assumed that because the patient had CSF dissemination, they had a medulloblastoma, but not in this case. The pineal region differential diagnosis, as we continue to emphasize, includes teratoma, germinoma, uh, and also pineal parenchymal tumors. Perhaps the two most important ways to distinguish between a pineal parenchymal tumor and a germ cell tumor is whether we have dispersed calcification, which we see in pineal parenchymal tumors, and whether we have restricted diffusion, which is more commonly noted with pineal parenchymal tumors. We can also do serum and CSF assays for various hormones that may be produced by the germ cells. Germinomas produce placental alkaline phosphatase, yolk sac tumors produce alpha feta protein, embryonal CA produces beta HCG and alpha feta protein, and of course, as you know, choriocarcinomas produce beta HCG. Let's go back to our basic approach. If it's not a germinoma, because it's not homogeneous and doesn't have a central calcification, and it's not a teratoma, because it doesn't contain any lipid material, it might be a pineal parenchymal tumor. There are several different flavors of pineal parenchymal tumors. And again, these represent less than 15% of pineal region masses. Well-differentiated pineocytomas are grade one. Rosette-forming glial neuronal tumors are also grade one. Pineal parenchymal tumors of intermediate differentiation may be grade two or grade three. Papillary tumors are grade two or grade three, and pineoblastomas are grade four lesions of the pineal parenchyma. So if we have a pineal parenchymal tumor and the pre-existing pineal gland contained the normal physiologic calcification, then the tumor may disperse or explode those pre-existing calcification. It's also possible that the pineal parenchyma in the neoplasm contains little dots of calcification. So there is a dispersed or peripheral pattern of calcification that is suggestive of a pineal parenchymal tumor. Here's a typical example of a pineoblastoma with peripheral marginal calcifications around the outside. A similar appearance can be seen with all tumors that arise within the pineal parenchyma. We can see the lesion shows the exploded calcifications and has homogeneous enhancement. And on the MR, we have a nonspecific appearance. So MR is less helpful outside of measuring the ADC values. Pineoblastoma may oftentimes have nonspecific appearance on MR and can mimic the appearance of a germinoma. This one also has seeding on the leaflets of tentorium. If we put this germinoma and pineoblastoma side by side, we can see that there are no distinguishing features on the standard MR imaging. If we want to summarize some important pineal region teaching points from an excellent review article from Insights Imaging, pineal parenchymal tumors have an explosion of pineal calcifications. Pineoblastomas can have restricted diffusion. Pineal teratomas and lipomas can have lipid signal intensity. Pineal lesions in patients with a known malignancy should include the possibility of metastatic disease in the differential diagnosis. And pineal cysts and arachnoid cysts will show the appropriate fluid signal similar to CSF. Just as we have seen with the germ cell tumors, the pineal parenchymal tumors can also cause hydrocephalus and may also be displaced and present partially or almost entirely within the posterior fossa. This beautiful gross picture here correlates with the coronal MR showing how the tumor is actually mostly in the posterior fossa. Now it's time to talk about the most common pineal region lesion, which is a pineal cyst. Pineal cysts are identified at autopsy in 5 to 40% of normal adults, 
They're typically less than two millimeters in diameter in a normal sized gland. They're visible on MR in a little bit less than 10% of adult patients. Because the normal pineal gland does not have a blood brain barrier, ring enhancement can be identified in pineal cysts. But the ring should have a thin, smooth rim and be less than three millimeters in diameter. Why do they grow? It's unknown. This is a classic example of a pineal cyst. The signal intensity is slightly different from CSF, but oftentimes they're identical to CSF. And again, this is extending below the tentorial hiatus, which is a feature we saw with the pineal region neoplasms. This was the first pineal cyst that I ever identified. Uh, the pineal gland is enlarged. The, the patient had some obstructive hydrocephalus and the patient was symptomatic. And this was actually resected. Notice that it does have a very thin, smooth rim of contrast enhancement. And once again, we see it's extending below the tentorium. So this is the pathology on the same case. And what we see is pineal parenchyma on the outside some calcification, so-called brain sand, similar to the calcifications we see in the normal pineal gland, and an empty fluid-filled space, a classic example of a benign pineal cyst. So what should be the follow-up for pineal cysts? My suggestion is that you find an article or a reference that you like, and you use that as the basis for your recommendations for follow-up. Most series show that pineal cysts do not routinely require imaging follow-up, and the development of symptoms in patients is usually unrelated to the pineal cyst. Numerous studies have been done showing that pineal cysts do not enlarge uh, in adult patients. So pineal cysts can probably be left alone, and they don't necessarily need to have follow-up. But like I said, find an article that you believe in and use that as a reference source for your decision making. A 2016 paper on incidental pineal cysts, which is different from symptomatic pineal cysts, showed that they do not require long-term neurosurgical follow-up because they tend to be stable in size. But this study recommended a single follow-up scan be performed at 12 months to confirm the diagnosis. It's time to round out our discussion of the pineal region by talking about the adjacent locations and adjacent lesions. Pineal region lipoma. Intracranial lipomas, including those in the pineal region, are congenital masses. They're not a true neoplasm. They represent abnormal differentiation from the Menning primitiva into fat. They should be relatively homogeneous fat attenuation on CD. They should be relatively homogeneous fat signal intensity on MR, there should not be any kind of a fluid level or heterogeneity. Once again, we can see how this lesion has caused obstructive hydrocephalus from pressing on the cerebral aqueduct in the midbrain, and that has pushed the tumor into the posterior fossa. Beautiful example here, but in a different patient of pathologic correlation, showing the yellowish color we would expect from fat, very different from the whitish color we see from sebaceous lipid material. Gliomas may arise from the nearby splenium, thalamus, or from the midbrain or tectal plate itself. This is a patient that shows an astrocytoma passing through the splenium of the corpus callosum and crossing from one side to the other. Notice that this is above the internal cerebral veins, and most pineal region masses are below the internal cerebral veins. We can see on the axial image how the enhancement is crossing through the splenium of the corpus callosum. This is a patient that has a glioma arising from the tectal plate. It's also causing obstructive hydrocephalus. This is a gross picture in a different patient illustrating the same findings of a grade two diffuse astrocytoma involving the quadrigeminal plate. Meningiomas may protrude into the quadrigeminal plate cistern after arising from the fox or the tentorium. They tend to be homogeneous, 
they will have homogeneous contrast enhancement, and they may have that helpful feature of showing us a dural tail. In the sagittal image here, we can see the nonspecific gray matter signal on T1, and again, homogeneous enhancement with gadolinium. Let's review what we've had a chance to talk about. We've seen pineal cysts, and we know that they are the most common pineal region abnormality occurring in slightly less than 10% of normal humans. The most common neoplasm is actually a germ cell tumor, and we saw how germinomas are homogeneous engulfing a central calcification, how teratomas are heterogeneous and show lipid material, and we discussed how the pineal parenchymal tumors may have restricted diffusion. The primary symptomatology is typically paranoid syndrome. The patients may also have precocious puberty or nonspecific signs and symptoms. Hydrocephalus pushes the tumor into the posterior fossa. We saw that several times, and we discussed very briefly some of the other lesions that may occur nearby, including meningiomas, gliomas, and lipomas. Let's finish by going over those six images that we use at the very beginning of the talk. The first image is a germinoma showing a central calcification surrounded by a hyperattenuating mass. The lesion with the lipid is a teratoma. Dispersed or displaced exploded calcifications are seen in pineal parenchymal tumors. The lipoma is hyperintense before contrast is given. Vein of Galen malformation show up as a prominent flow void, and we finished with a meningioma. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention during this talk.